my phone went off. Usually, no, that's somebody else's email. Mm, let's see. Make sure it didn't, no, it didn't go to spam. David Cowan, 1949 at gmail.com. And it's got to be C-O-W-A-N. I think maybe one time you misspelled it E-N, and it's never disappeared from your list of defaults. I'm not sure. Let me check. Set. Uh, it didn't send. All right. Okay. I'm doing uh, limits and discontinuity. So. You might have some questions if they give you the graph and ask you about limits as you approach certain points. But if it's just algebraic functions, we can do those verbally. Mm. They're, uh, they're algebra yeah. functions. Okay. Uh, let me should... just write my email in case you are misspelling it. We certainly want you to be able to send me pictures from your material. I've got about four pre-calc students now that are all doing limits. Seems like that, that's not always been true. It used to only be certain classes did limits. Now all, everybody's doing them. You want to give it another shot or you want to just, shall we go in? No, I, I just sent it. Okay. And now go ahead and verbalize one while we're waiting. All right. The limit so, of... Or actually, actually no. It's the uh, it's a find the equation of a uh, of a, a tangent. Uh, find the equation that will determine the slope of a tangent okay. of a line tangent to the graph. Okay. What's the function? There it came in. Hold on. Or that. Yeah. I think I've actually seen this problem also. Probably. Uh, star here. Uh, oh gosh. You got to help me rotate this. This is one of these pictures that came in sideways, and you're the only one that knows how to do it. I I don't know how to do it. And nobody's been able to tell me how to do it. Oh. Uh... Pop out details. No, that's not going to help. No. Uh, that's just zooming in and out. That's sharing, that's downloading, printing, save to drive. How the heck do you rotate this thing? I don't know how to do it with the Gmail. Uh-oh. Well, I'm not, well, I guess I am looking at it in Gmail. Ah, you just hit upon the answer. Let me download it and open the file separately. Yeah, now if I double click on that file, I should have, yeah, now I can rotate it. How strange is this? Who knew? But thank you. You helped me solve that problem. So which one are we doing here? I have seen this. Yeah. Um, In fact, you, you have Miss Moore. What's her name? What's your yeah, Miss Moore. Is that your teacher? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I met her the other day. In fact, I went to the class. The other student I have and her and the parents of the student was not a pretty sight. It wasn't a pleasant meeting. Wait, is, is it Emma? Yes, it is. Yeah. She sits right behind me and we're... I'm not... Neither me nor her are very good in that class, but once I get to you, I'm fine. Huh. Like, I understand it. Uh-huh. Well, good. And, but, Glad to hear that. Yeah, the only thing I could gather is that sometimes Miss Moore just reads writing on a page to try to explain something. Uh, yes. And uh, that's never a good thing. That doesn't accomplish much. So, yeah. you want to start with one here, or are you good to go on one? One, I understand. 
And then okay. two let's and four. Make, are let's make one thing clear about one, because, gosh, I hate to say this, but I think Miss Moore is mistaken on her answer here. Um, I'll show you what I mean. She wants you to show, provide the resulting piecewise function. Okay. Well, the first one, the, the numerator is the difference of cubes. So it factors into x minus 5 times what? Uh, x squared plus 10x plus 25, right? Yeah. Bottom's difference of squares, so it factors into x minus 5 times x plus 5. So what's our domain restriction here? Is it just uh, 5? No, it's both of them. In other words, x can never be 5 and x can never be negative 5 from this right here, the original function. Okay. The fact that I can now do this does not allow you to make x equal 5. It merely puts a hole in the thing. So if I'm graphing this function, I now have an asymptote here at minus 5, a vertical asymptote. And I have a hole at plus 5. In other words, let's say the function does something like, I don't know, it looks quadratic in nature. Uh, let's say it does this. Well, there's a hole right here. Okay. So, she says, write it in piecewise fashion. Well, the piecewise fashion is, and I, I know what the answer that she gave you is, and I don't think she's right, to be honest, but here, I will write the answer she tried to tell the class. That's what it is when x is not plus everywhere except, here's what I think she told the class. Uh, g of x is equal to, and you can plug in 5 for x, and, well, hold on, yeah, over x plus 5, yeah. When you plug in 5 for x, you get, what, 5 sixths or something? Is that right? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to just guess, whether, rather than waste the time to go through it. Let's say you get 5 sixths when x equals 5. And you get this when x is equal to anything else, and you get nothing when x is equal to minus 5. However, this statement is not correct. <laughs> g of x is not equal to 5 sixths when x is equal to 5. By definition, when you have a whole, x can never be 5. That's one number that x cannot be. There are two restrictions on x from the original function. One of them is x cannot be positive 5, and the other is x cannot be negative 5. The fact that one of them is a vertical asymptote and the other one is a whole doesn't matter. Now, perhaps what she meant was the following. The limit of g of x as x approaches 5 is equal to 5 sixths. That is a proper statement but it's not really part of a definition of a piecewise function. Uh, I've never really seen anybody do this where um, they try to turn the limit problem into a piecewise function. Um, and this is what Emma told me that she did, was it was equal to this, except and then she said when x was equal to 5, she plugged it in and came up with a number and said that y was equal to that number when x was equal to 5. Well, that's what's not true. X cannot be, that's not in the domain of x. 5 is not in the domain. 
you can have all real numbers except plus or minus 5. Okay. Okay. So, so if I had to do a test, mm -hmm. it would just be that it's not like what she was showing us? Well, God, I don't know how to answer that, uh, Mitch, because I don't want to give you something that you're going to get wrong on the test because it's not the way she did it. Here's what I would do if I was doing it. I would say g of x is equal to x squared plus 10x plus, what the heck was that number, 25, when x is less than minus 5 all over, what, x plus 5? Yeah. So that's the function when x is less than minus 5. This is the function when x is between minus 5 and 5. In other words, when x is greater than minus 5 but less than 5, that's what the function is. And finally, I've never seen anybody where you have the same exact function listed three times in piecewise fashion. I've never seen anybody do that, but when x is greater than 5. So when I first did this problem with Emma, this is the way I did it. And then Emma told me, no, that's not the way she did it. She basically yeah. gave two answers for the piecewise function. One was this, whenever x was not equal to minus or plus 5. And the other one where she plugged in 5, she came up with a number, and I think it was 5 sixths. Yeah, it was some number. I don't know. Yeah. And that was she said, that so she said that uh, this one, uh, g of x, is equal to 5 sixths when x is equal to 5 or something like that. And that's yeah, and not a true statement. That is not a true statement. You can't have x equal to 5. What the true statement would be is the limit of g of x as x approaches 5 would be 5 sixths. That you can have. And that is a true statement. So you're going to have to kind of either talk to the teacher before you take the test as to how she wants the answers or just do it the way she told you to do it in class, even if it's wrong. Okay. Okay? I don't know what else to tell you. It's not very often where I have a point of disagreement with a math teacher. I, I can count on three fingers the number of times it's happened to me in seven years, and this is one. And I think she's just a little confused. Uh, uh, does Miss Moore teach calculus at all? No. Okay. So limits are probably the upper limit of her math knowledge. I, I know. I think she's taught calculus, but she got demoted from calculus when okay. Cannon came. This is a true statement, assuming that that number is 5 6 when I plug it in. But to say that g of x is equal to 5, 6 when x is equal to 5 is not true. x cannot be equal to 5. There are two gaps in the domain, minus 5 and plus 5. And the, the hole didn't go away just because I canceled out that factor. The hole never goes away. You always have to go back to the original function to find your domain restrictions. Now. Since we don't have much time and the next problem is kind of tricky, let's get on with the next problem. Because it's going to be the hardest one on this page. Because it's not real clear how to start it out. Is it just uh, syntax division? No. You can't factor that, the numerator. I noticed you tried to group it by putting the yeah. parentheses, but the only time grouping works is if the coefficient of these two terms is the same ratio as the coefficient of those two terms. Well, this is minus one-fourth, and that's minus 11 thirtieths, so that's not true. 
So I, there's no easy way to factor that. I can use the rational factor theorem, which says the numerator has to be a factor of 30. Okay, that would take me a half an hour to do. But the fact that this problem is on the page and we're looking at that numerator over this denominator, what do you suppose the denominator factors into what? x plus 3, x minus 3. Guarantee you that that's one of the factors of the numerator. Yeah, so uh, no, once we find that. You synthetic the division to find out which one. Yeah, that's what she told us to do. Yeah, and not only that, but when you're done with the synthetic division, you will have the quadratic that's left over. I think it's negative 3 that's the correct one, if I remember right. I'm doing it with Emma. You know, how you remember synthetic division? Yeah, so you pull the first one down, and so it's 1, and then it's negative 3. Wherever I'm, wherever I'm pointing, tell me the number I should write. Negative 7. And then 21. 10. And then negative 30. Ah, and then when we add that, we get 0, the magic 0. That means negative 3 is a 0 of that cubic, which means which factor? In other words, if I'm factoring this, what are my two factors now? It's the, is it x plus 3 or x minus 3? x minus plus. This is yeah. always the zero. If that, okay. we've just determined that negative 3 is a zero, which makes x plus 3 the factor. In other yeah. words, if I told you x minus 3 times x plus 3 was equal to zero, you would come to the conclusion that either x is equal to 3 or x is equal to minus 3. Well, in this case, we just proved that it's x equals minus 3, which makes the factor x plus 3, what's this quadratic? The second factor. It's x squared minus 7x plus 10. Yeah, that's the beauty of synthetic division, is that not only do you determine whether 3 or minus 3 is a 0, but you're left with the other factor without doing any more work. Okay, now that's exactly what I was expecting. In other words, this wouldn't be much of a problem if the numerator did not have one of the factors from the denominator, right? Yeah. So it's a fair assumption to make that the, the numerator, one of those factors, must be one of these factors. And if you operate on that principle, you can find it fairly quickly. You only have to try minus 3 and plus 3 first one I tried was plus 3, and it didn't produce the 0, so I immediately tried minus 3, and it worked. Now we have the same kind of problem we just got done with, right? Yeah. It's exactly the same. I've got a vertical asymptote at x equal 3. I got a hole at x equal minus 3. So the final result is going to be x squared minus 7x plus 10 all over x minus 3 with x not being able to be equal to plus or minus 3. And that's my answer. I think it's silly to put it in piecewise fashion, especially the way she's done it. But don't tell her that. Yeah. probably already doesn't like me after our meeting. Not that I said anything nasty to her. In fact, I tended to agree with her on most of what she said. But 
Um, yeah. In this particular problem, I think she's made a mistake. Um, not that you need to argue with her. Don't don't do that either. Uh, no, I'm not going that won't to help your cause. Um, but that's that's the answer. X can never be plus or minus three, and when it's not ever plus or minus three, it's this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, let's see. We have just a moment or two. I think that really was the toughest problem, but um, let me... There's another one just like it on here. Yeah, four is number like four. it. Number three is just like number one, only yeah. you need your sum of cubes, which you've done properly there. But number four is just like number two. Again, no grouping allowed, but look at the denominator and tell me what one of those factors almost certainly has to be. Uh, X plus one or X minus one. Correct. Use synthetic division to figure out which. And then whatever you're left with is what doesn't cancel. Okay. Right. This one actually would not be that hard to do based on the rational factor theorem. Because you know the numerator has to be 21 or 1, right? Oh, no, no. There's 7 and 3 also are factors of 21. It was particularly hard in number 2 because there are so many factors of 30. There were so many possible solutions. But yeah. always base it. When you see a problem like this, always assume that one of the linear factors of this cubic function is going to match one of the linear factors in the denominator. And that's true for number four also. I don't remember which one it is, but I think you can work it out at this point. Yeah. Okay. Um, what next? And then it's the, um, the other one is like you sent me two pages? Yeah. Yeah, you did. Hold on a moment. Let me download this so we can take a quick look at it. Unfortunately, I have a 4 o'clock, so I can't go over. But um, hmm. I didn't hit the download button, did I? No. No. All right. Well, I'm glad I figured out how to do that. That's going to be helpful. Huh. Doesn't do it instantly either. If you didn't know it did it, you wouldn't necessarily know how to... might not wait long enough. All right. Let's take a look at 14 really quick. I'll, I'll go through the the way we would do 14 if we had time to do it. Yeah. This is the classic equation of calculus. Find the equation that will determine the slope of the line tangent to that curve at any value m. Well, you've had derivatives? Mm, kind of. I don't know. She talked about it, but she didn't really explain like what. Well, let me. Just, since I really only have three minutes. I'm just going to give you the quick course in derivatives and what they mean. First derivative means slope. Okay. You can take the first derivative or find the first derivative. By using the power rule, take that exponent, multiply it by that, subtract one from the exponent. The derivative of any constant is zero. So this is my derivative. And she said, at any value m. So my slope is going to be 6m. Okay? Now... We know what slope is if I have a straight line, and they're talking the slope of the t line tangent. That's a straight line. 
So I know that straight line can be put into this format. Now they've gone out of their way to particularly confuse us by using the variable m, not to be confused with the slope m. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They didn't have to use m for this variable. They could have called it z or something like that, and the problem would have been a little easier. Well, so the equation of this line is y equals, well, what's the slope of the line? 6m x plus b. There's the equation of the line at any m. Well, not quite because we haven't solved for b. If we had a number in there for b, we would have the slope of the line at any m. Well, let's not do it using this. Let's do it using point slope format. y minus y sub 1 equals the slope times x minus x sub 1. And now we know that the point x is equal to m. Well, so what's the point they're talking about? m, when I plug m in here, I get 3m squared minus 5. So that's the point. There's the x-coordinate of the point. There's the y-coordinate of the point. You with me? Uh-huh. Okay, so now I have y minus y sub 1, which is that point. I'll put it in parentheses, 3m squared minus 5 equals our slope, which is 6m, times x minus m. That's x sub 1 is m. And there is your answer. Right. And notice that I didn't have to solve for b. I didn't need to because I used point slope format. But this is a question for second month calculus students, maybe third month not last month pre-calc students. In other words, there's a lot you have to learn about calculus in order to be able to do this problem the way I did it. But this is your answer. Notice that it's in terms of y, x, and m. Mitch, I will we'll finish these later tonight. I've got you down for 7.30. Talk to you then. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.